Hi, welcome back to McClatchy Maths. My name is Natalie McClatchy and we are continuing our series today on 2022's external exams in Queensland for general mathematics. And we are looking at paper one and the short answer questions for bivariate data. So we've already covered the multiple choice in a previous video. These are the short answer questions worth more than one mark. Let's get right into it. We've got two questions today. The first question on paper one was question 16 and it was worth three marks. It says, this table shows the number of sales for a small business in their first six months of trading. In part A, we're asked to use our calculators to determine the equation of the least squares line, and this is worth one mark. Now, I have a Casio calculator, so I'm going to be showing you on that one today, but there are a range of other calculators that are um, allowed to be used by the QCAA for your exam. You need to really familiarize yourself with your calculator. So when I'm showing you what my calculator does, see if you can have a look on your calculator and work out what the right buttons to press are. And if in doubt, ask your teacher. So firstly, we're going to be using our calculator. We're going to get into this uh, mode setup button here, and we're going to choose two for statistics. Um, if it doesn't come up straight away, when you press that button, try the shift button. Then we're going to get this menu here. It looks quite confusing, and a lot of these buttons on here you'll never use. We're going to be using number two here, which is our equation of a least squared regression line, y equals a plus bx. So if we press the number two button on our calculator down in the keypad down the bottom here, then what's going to come up is this menu with an X, Y table. This should be familiar with you. You should have been doing this with your teacher. And we're simply going to translate this information. These are our X values and these are our Y values. I know it says T and N, but don't worry about that because this is our independent variable and this is our dependent variable. Once you've entered those into the table, it will look something like this. To move around this little table here on your calculator, you're going to use your equals button, which is right underneath here. Okay, so now you've entered your table, you're going to press the all clear button, the AC button. A lot of students thought that was air conditioning, it's all clear. And then you're going to end up pressing your shift button back on the top here and the number one button, the statistics button right here, you can see that circle down the bottom there. So pressed shift then one. You'll come up with this new menu here. And the one we're interested in is this button five. Um, for, it says reg there, that means regression. And so we're going to choose the five button down there. We'll now get this new menu here and we're interested in A because we're looking for the formula Y equals A plus BX. We want to find A first. So if we press the one and then press the equals button on our calculator, we're going to find that A is equal to 55.4. Now we need to repeat that last part of the process again to find B. So we go back to pressing the shift button, back to pressing one for statistics. We're gonna get this menu up again. We're gonna select five for regression, then two to get B. And then two on our bottom of our calculator. Press your equals button and you'll get B is equal to 42.6. So we can see there now we're writing that down on our sheet. As you can see, it's only worth one mark. So you've got to get both of them right and they need to be in the right order. If you're using a um, Texas Instruments calculator, there's a very strong possibility it gets A and B back to front. You need to be aware of that. Now, we're actually going to use the variables here now. So remember, this is our independent variable, which means it's our X value. This is our dependent variable, which means it's our Y value. So we're going to actually put those into the least squared equation using T and N. A lot of students would be um, tempted to use X and Y because that's what's familiar to you. However, the question doesn't use X and Y, it uses T and N. So you need to use the right variables here. Okay, that was part A, one mark. And we've correctly determined the equation, so we get that mark. Okay, let's move on to part B. We've got to use that equation now to predict the number of sales, N, in the 21st month. So our X value, or our T value, is going to be 21. So we're going to substitute into the equation T equals 21. And that means that we're going to put T equals 21 here. A lot of students don't remember that there is an imaginary multiplication sign in between the 42.6 and the T. So it's 42.6 times T, not plus T. So you're going to be doing 21 times 42.6 here when we're working this out. So we put that in. A lot of also students will make mistakes of adding these two numbers first 
and then multiplying the answer by 21. That's another very common mistake. You need to remember this is almost in invisible brackets here. So we need to multiply this first following our order of operations, bid mass. Um, we're going to do multiplication before we do addition. That's the MA in mass. So you need to make sure you're following that correctly. We're going to work out um, that we get our first mark for substituting correctly into the equation. And our last mark will be from adding those two numbers together and working out that N is equal to 950. Our predicted sales are 950 sales. Not a bad idea to consider writing a statement there because we weren't asked to find N, we were asked to find the predicted sales. Um, if the predicted sales ended up being a number with multiple decimal places, you'd want to make sure you round that properly uh, because you notice here all of the sales are whole numbers. So just be careful of that too in future. Let's move on to question 23. It's our second and last question for this video. It's worth four marks. The least squared line has been provided for a scatter plot that shows the association between an employer's years of experience, N, and their hourly pay, P. So we can see N's along here, the years of experience, hourly pay is P. We can have a very quick view of this. We can see that it's trending upwards. So the implication is that the more years of experience you have, your pay should go up, hopefully. Okay, we're asked to use um, our least squared regression line um, equation and we actually need to come up with it. We're told it passes through two points, 220 and 740. We've got to come up with that equation, two marks. Now, this is where a lot of students last year in 2022 may have come unstuck because they don't remember how to do this. This is year 11 foundational um, least squared line work. It's the sort of stuff you've been doing since probably grade nine, coming up with the equation of a line given two points. So I'm gonna recap that for you today. Our starting place is to find the gradient of the line. And we find that using our formula sheet, and it's M equals Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. Now, this is something really important that you've learned from grade nine, grade 10, you learned it again in grade 11. It probably didn't touch a lot of it in year 12, but this is something that they asked you to do. So um, it's assumed in year 12 that you remember everything from year 11. So even though you may not have been studying it, it's assumed you know how to apply it. Okay, now common mistakes people make when they're using this gradient formula. Firstly, they think this is a squared, um, it's not a squared. It's a subscript. It means it sits below the Y. You can see it's smaller and it's sitting below, not a power sitting above. Um, so it's not squared at all. Another common mistake that students make with using this formula is they can't remember whether it's the X's on the top or the Y's on the top. It is on your formula sheet, so just use it there. The next thing that they forget is which of these is the X and which is the Y. Um, if you remember, it goes alphabetical order, so X then Y. And it's the same over here, X then Y. Now the next thing students um, really um, are in a rush to do, and what they forget is which one is point one and which one is point two. So I would always recommend, label your two points. Call this one point one and this one point two. So that means this is X1 and Y1, this is X2 and Y2. And then it's the case of just simply checking carefully and putting it into the equation, substituting that in carefully. So you'll notice I have put in my second Y value over here. I'm calling this one Y2 today. So that's 20. And then we're gonna take Y1 away, which is the 40. And then we're gonna go back to X2 here. And we're gonna put in the two. And then we're gonna put in the seven. So it's very important that you don't get this jumbled up because I do see students all the time that get the four numbers in all the wrong places and you end up with a completely wrong answer. Okay, so what we're gonna do now, 20 take away 40 is negative 20, two take away seven is negative five. Remember that a negative divided by a negative is a positive. So that means it's gonna be the same as 20 divided by five, which would just be four. Okay, so our gradient is four. Now that we've found the gradient, we can choose either of these two points to substitute it into. So we know we've got a point now for correcting, correctly determining the slope. We've got to get that y-intercept now. We know the basic form of a line is y equals mx plus c. We found the gradient of four. So we can put that into the equation where we see m. We've still got three variables, a y, an x, and a c. We've got to find c, that's our, our y-intercept. Now, if you look over here, we've got two points. We've got the point 220 and we've got the point 740. We could substitute either of these because we've got an X value and a Y value, an X value and a Y value. And because the line passes through those two points, 
it makes the equation true. So when I substitute, um, I could substitute in y equals 40 and x equals 7 here, or I could substitute in y equals 20 from this point over here and x equals 2. It doesn't matter which one you choose. I always like to choose the one with the smallest numbers or the numbers that aren't negative or fractions. It's always easier to work linear equations with easy numbers. So let's substitute in the point 220. It's got the smaller numbers. So we're going to replace the y with 20 and the x with a 2. So now on this side, I've now got 20. And instead of an x, I've got a 2. 4 times 2 makes 8. And we're going to take 8 away from both sides to find c. So we're going to find out our y-intercept is equal to 12. And therefore, our equation is y equals 4x plus 12. And we get our next mark because we have found the equation of the least squared regression line. We need to actually use the variables that we've been given, remember, p and n. A lot of people will stop that off with y equals 4x plus 12 because that's familiar, but you need to use the letters that they've given you here. And I would say a lot of students may have forgotten to do that at the end. Now we've got to use that equation in part B to, to predict the hourly pay of an employee with 15 years experience. This is almost identical to the previous short answer question we had to do earlier. So um, instead of, we had to find the equation first um, using our calculator, this time we're finding our, our equation using two points. So similar but different skills. So now we're going to put in 15 years of experience. So N equals 15, we're going to substitute that into our equation. And that means 4 times 15, which is 60, plus 12. So that substitution mark is worth a mark. And then 60 plus 12 gives us 72. Also a good idea to write a statement. The hourly pay is $72. It's not just P equals 72. We've found an amount and it has units of measurement being dollar sign. And that is our um, second mark. Notice here that the QCAA was expecting you to use the units, the dollar sign. So it wouldn't have been good enough to just write P equals 72. You could have lost a mark there, 1% of your grade, just for not putting that dollar sign on. So be very careful that when you're going through the process that you check your work and make sure you always write a statement at the end of anything that where you've used an equation to find a real life answer. Okay, wow, I didn't realize there was a third question here. I should have known I prepared this before. But here we go, we've got question 24. They really went to town at the QCAA with bivariate data in this short answer paper. We've got a five marker here. The maximum temperature and the number of pies sold each day at a bakery are provided in the table. We need to construct a scatter plot to display the data on the grid provided. And it's worth three marks for our graph. So we want to do a good graph here. Graphing is not difficult, but there's lots of little things that people forget. So firstly, we've given grid paper. And let's start off by drawing in a y-axis and an x-axis. Now you notice I didn't draw them at a cross. And the reason for that is that all our values are positive. So we're not going to be using any of the negative quadrants at all. So we don't need to draw those in. The, the next thing I need to do is make sure I label my axes. I've got the number of pies sold on the y-axis, the maximum temperature in degrees Celsius on the x-axis. Um, and because I've now identified which variables go where, because remember, usually our first line in our table is the x values. Because I've labeled those up properly, I'm getting my first mark. My second mark, well, the next thing I need to do is actually to pop in all of my numbers. And there wasn't a lot of space in the grid provided. So I've started this x-axis from zero and I'm going up in increments of five. What I should do here, though, is these little, they look like lightning bolts. That indicates that I've broken my axis, their axis breaks, because this is zero here, and where the two axes meet is always zero, and I've gone jumped straight to 15, and then I'm going up in five. So that's not scaled correctly if I don't put the little lightning bolt on there, okay? Same with this one here. I'm starting from 20, because I've, if you look up here, my lowest value is 20, and so I'm gonna put that little break in the axis here. Otherwise, I'm gonna end up with lots of, if I start from zero and go count up in twos or threes, I'm gonna end up with a lot of empty space in the bottom of my scatter plot. Okay, the next step now is, um, because I've done that scatter plot with correct scaling and I've labeled my axes, I get another mark. And the scaling is important. A lot of students are very tempted to read the numbers off here and then to just write those numbers on there with no regard for the space that's in between them. You need to scale correctly. What I mean by scaling correctly is that the difference between each of these tick marks on the right hand side 
is the same. So I've started at 20, they're going up in equal twos. And you can see that, well, it's a little bit faint, but they're actually hitting right on the axis lines in exactly twos. And these are going up in exactly fives. That's worth mark. Okay, now what I need to do is to start plotting my points. So my first point is 29, 32. So I come across to 29 and then up to 32, put a clear dot on there. And I'm gonna continue that process. So my next one is 20, then 39. And 31, 25, 27, 33, 23, 37, and so on. So all of my dots are going to be appearing there. Okay, so now I've constructed the scatter plot. And that's worth another mark because I've accurately, put, accurately plotted my points. So make sure you try and do that to the best of your ability. Now, the reason why I've gone up in twos here, each of these um, rows is equal to a whole number. So that makes it very easy for me to accurately plot those points. So, and same with these ones here, I've started at 15, but these are all one, two, three, four, five. There's a line for every one. So they're all sitting exactly on where an X and a Y meet. So it's very easy to be accurate. So be very careful when you choose your scale. Okay, my next step is to describe the association between the maximum temperature and the number of pies sold in terms of direction and strength, and it's worth two marks. So I'm gonna be describing the correlation or the relationship or the association. Remember, these are all interchangeable words. And we do that by describing direction and strength. That's all we're asked to talk about. Well, direction, it goes from high down to low. So it starts high and it's heading down towards the big X numbers which means we've got negative correlation. So that's our first one, it's worth the mark. And if we look at the strength of that there, even though you've got this point that's hanging out here, it could be considered an outlier, but most of these ones here are very close together. So therefore it would be strong correlation. Um, be very careful not to hedge your bets and say um, moderately strong or strongly moderate or anything like that. You need to pick one or the other. It's either strong or moderate. You could actually verify that by putting this in your calculator. You could actually do that. That would take you a few minutes. But remember, it's only worth a mark. You could actually put this in the calculator. It might take you maybe 60 seconds to do that. You could actually come up with an R correlation but you're only being asked to do it by looking at the graph. So that could be a way you could check your work if you had a bit of time left over at the end of the exam, is to check it by finding the actual correlation. Um, but strong is the answer. Well, did you find the video helpful? If you did, why not tell somebody to share it with your teacher, share it with a sibling or a friend. You could like and subscribe to the channel to engage with us further and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. If you've got any questions about anything you saw today, a future video you might like to see something on, mcclatchymass at yahoo.com for video requests and comments. And you can always comment in the feed underneath if you really enjoyed the video. Well, thank you so much for watching today. I'm Natalie McClatchy and you've been watching McClatchy Mass. Have a wonderful day.